Hello, hello everyone. My name is Tess Killian, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the fifth annual Cannabis in Practice webinar series hosted by the Washtenaw County Health Department and Livingston County Health Department in partnership with the Washtenaw County Medical Society and Livingston Physician Organization. This webinar series is aimed at addressing questions our local and regional healthcare providers have about cannabis use and their patients. Our speakers come from a wide range of backgrounds and are experts in their respective fields. Funding for this series comes from the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Cannabis Regulatory Agency. This webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on our website, washtenaw.org slash marijuana in the coming weeks. Before we get started, we ask that all questions for our speaker be asked through the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time at the end of the webinar for the speaker to answer questions. Now I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tori Metz. Dr. Metz is Vice Chair for Research and an Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Utah Health. She is a practicing maternal fetal medicine subspecialist. Dr. Metz completed both her medical school and residency training at the University of Colorado. She then went on to complete her maternal fetal medicine fellowship and master of science in clinical investigation at the University of Utah in 2012. She is a member of the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine Clinical Document Review Panel and sits on the board of directors. Nationally, she has served on the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Committee of Clinical Practice Guidelines and is an American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology board examiner for both specialty and subspecialty boards. She is the deputy editor for obstetrics for the Green Journal, Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is the PI for the U Utah Center of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver NICHD Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network and has RO1 funding from the National Institutes of Health to study the association between cannabis use and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Metz. Um, I will let you take it away with your presentation. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. All right. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, cannabis use during a pregnancy and while breastfeeding and uh, with a subtitle of sorting through hazy evidence, because it's, it's hard to get to the bottom of this and know how to talk to patients about this. I don't have any conflicts of interest related to the content of this presentation. Today, we're going to talk about the prevalence of cannabis use in pregnancy and the reported reasons for use. Learn how to counsel women regarding the risk of cannabis use during pregnancy and while breastfeeding based on the current evidence, and then recommend and utilize available resources when counseling individuals about cannabis use in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. So cannabis use is the most common illicit drug use in pregnancy. Now I recognize that it is now uh, legal in the majority of states, um, but you know it is still a schedule one drug. Um, it crosses the placenta and there's increasing use with increasing legalization of recreational cannabis across the United States. Um, there is increasing prevalence of use. Uh, the reported prevalence in the literature really ranges anywhere from three to 30%. It kind of depends on uh, the study population as well as how they are ascertaining use. So whether they're doing it through self-report or biologic sampling. Um, there are data from the National Service on Drug Use and Health, which is a large cross-sectional nationally representative study, um, where they found that 2.4% uh, rate of past month use among pregnant patients in 2002. This increased to 3.9% in 2014, and then increased to 4.9% in 2016. So we're seeing increasing use um, contemporaneously with increasing legalization. Um, there is a group at Kaiser Permanente in uh, Northern California that's also done a lot of work in this area, uh, led by uh, Kelly Young Wolf. She has a large retrospective cohort that was collected between 2009 and 2017 um, of 280,000 pregnant individuals who had urine toxicology testing during the first trimester of pregnancy. This was standard of care within the Kaiser system at that time, and so they sampled everybody. On urine toxicology, the rate of a uh, positive um, urine sample for cannabis metabolites was 4.9%. 
and self-reported it's about 2.5%. So this is pretty consistent with all the literature. It's about double when you actually, the prevalence is about double when you, when you actually biologically sample compared to self-report. She looked at characteristics that are associated with, you know, self-reporting or not self-reporting. And she found that being older of Hispanic ethnicity and lower household income were all associated with misclassification of not using cannabis by self-report, meaning patients who are older, Hispanic and lower household income were less likely to self-report use. We, actually, we did a study when I was in Colorado, which is where I initially became interested in doing this work um, when cannabis was legalized there in 2012. And we had, um, we looked at paired samples. So we had enrolled 116 uh, people and we had an umbilical cord segment from them. We asked them to fill out a survey about their cannabis use. And we also looked in the medical record to see if there were any notes about cannabis use. And what we found is that 2.6% of patients in, a, in an environment where it was legal reported use to healthcare uh, professionals. 6% reported use in the last 30 days on an anonymous survey. So we gave them a survey and said, we're not going to share this with your healthcare practitioners, but we want you to be honest with us about your use in the past 30 days. That went up to 6% then. And then when we actually sampled the umbilical cord segments for this patient population, 10% of them had a positive uh, THC metabolite result above um, the, the limit of quantification, which is what we use for uh, clinical work. So if you were looking at, if you were sending an umbilical cord for clinical purposes and testing it for cannabis metabolite, 10% of the cords would have been positive. For research work, we go down to a lower limit um, because we can see that you know there is cannabis metabolite there. We're more cautious when we're reporting a clinical result as positive, but we did find metabolite in 22% of the cords, and you know we we truly believe it is there in that in that proportion. And so really, we're seeing you know this was an underestimate by about tenfold. So 2.6% had reported, and about 22% actually had some use. So um, the other question is what has happened during the pandemic? And I think this has really brought a lot of attention, this article. This was a, a manuscript that was also published by Dr. Young Wolf and just demonstrated that, you know, you sort of see this prevalence of cannabis use that's pretty stable um, in 2019. And then starting in 2020, you really do see this bump up in cannabis use uh, during the height of the uh, initial pandemic. So people often ask me like, well, why do people use cannabis during pregnancy? What are the reasons for use? Um, these are, these data are a little bit old, but I think that they uh, have some points that are worth mentioning. So this was a Tri-County Health Department uh, in Colorado survey where they surveyed women who are participating in the special supplemental nutrition program for women and infants and children or WIC program. They have a monthly caseload there of about 25,000 clients. And they took a convenient sample of about 1,700 individuals who had walked in and they asked them to complete a survey. Um, and they asked about the reasons for cannabis use and people who had uh, used. So, and it's people who had ever used cannabis. Um, a lot of the, you know, you can see the breakdown here for reasons for use. Interesting, on the people who had current use who were pregnant, what you see is the majority of them saw some reason for use, some benefit of use. And so, 63% of them said it helps with depression, anxiety, stress, 60% said it helps with pain, 48% said it helps with nausea, vomiting. And it's the minority that said they're doing it for fun or recreation or another reason. Whereas those who are not currently using in pregnancy and just had past use, the majority of them said, oh, they used it for fun or recreation, 65%. So I think this is really important for healthcare professionals to know that people who are using cannabis in pregnancy are using it because they have a perceived benefit. So when we delve into that, what do we know about that? And so, you know, nausea and vomiting pregnancy is uh, something that's commonly mentioned, right? As people think about cannabis use. Um, Dr. Young Wolf also did a retrospective cohort, same population out in Kaiser, Northern California, where they do universal screening with eutoxin and questionnaire. In this case, they look for ICD diagnoses of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. And what they found is that in these in this population of patients who use cannabis, about 2.4% of them had a code for severe nausea and 15% of them had a code for mild nausea. Now we know that's a little bit undercoded because I would say as a practicing OBGYN that I, it is much closer to 60, 70% of my patients have some degree of nausea during pregnancy. It's not just something that we typically would code for in terms of billing purposes. So we know it's under capturing a little bit, but what they find is that what they found was that individuals with severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy 
and those with mild nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy had increased odds of marijuana use. Now it's hard to know which one comes first, right? Did people have more severe nausea? And so then they turned to trying to use cannabis or did they use cannabis and that resulted then is associated with right more severe nausea. And that is essentially impossible to sort out just in terms of temporality, given these data. Um, but there does seem to be a relationship between people using cannabis and having um, higher levels of nausea and vomiting. We also looked at this in another cohort, um, the relationship between nausea and vomiting, cannabis use. And what we found similarly in people who had urine, so we had about 10,000 patients. In this cohort, people actually filled out um, in real time what's called the puke questionnaire, which is a measure of the level of nausea and vomiting uh, in pregnancy. And that what was happening in this cohort was they provide, they were just coming in for a normal study visit, visit for other purposes. They provided a urine sample. They did the puke questionnaire and a number of other questionnaires. And we just looked at the relationship between that urine testing positive for cannabis metabolite and their level of nausea and vomiting. And what we see here is that um, basically in every category, the people who had a positive urine for THC COH, which is one of the metabolites, um, which is in black compared to those who did not have it, which is in gray, essentially across all of these categories, you see that the people who were using cannabis or a cannabis metabolite have higher rates of the symptoms. So higher rates of having moderate to mild symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy, higher rates of hours of nausea per day, higher rates of episodes of vomiting per day, and higher episodes of uh, dry heaps per day. So on this questionnaire, there was definitely a relationship between cannabis use and more increasing severity of nausea and vomiting. The other thing is that that we need that we talk about a lot is just perception of safety. And there does seem to be an increasing perception of safety of cannabis use and pregnancy broadly in the population. These are data um, out of Pittsburgh from Marion Jerlinski looking at, again, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health data and looking at the, how, whether people perceive a risk of cannabis use during pregnancy. So they compared 2005 to 2015 data and among participants who had no past 30 day use, but were pregnant in 2005, 3.5% of them said they felt there was no risk to cannabis use during pregnancy. In 2015, it went up to 16% of them said there was no risk of cannabis use during pregnancy. And perhaps even uh, more impressive is among these patients who are past 30 day use and currently pregnant, so people who are using cannabis during pregnancy. In 2005, 26% of them said they thought there was no risk. And in 2015, 65% of them felt there was no risk. And so there is an increase in perception of safety of cannabis use in pregnancy among uh, pregnant individuals. So then what, how do we talk to patients about it? What are the risks? What do the data say? And that's what I'm going to delve into now. Um, but I think I need to do that with a major caveat that there are problems with existing studies that are out there. Okay. Most of the studies have a lack of quantification and timing of exposure. There's difficulty adjusting for tobacco, other drugs, and sociodemographic factors. There's a heavy reliance on self-report. Um, and just to show you, I show you some of the data about self-report, you know, it probably underestimates in most studies by two to three fold, in some studies by as much as tenfold. Um, there was a study by Shiono and colleagues in 1995 where they completed a prospective cohort study with structured interviews and maternal serum toxicology screens. Okay, so toxicology in the serum picks up probably the last 48 hours of use. 70% of individuals with a positive THC on serum tox screen denied use in a structured interview. So 70% of those who tested positive for cannabis metabolite in their serum who knew they were in a drug test, a study about drug testing and drug use said they did not use. Now there's a huge desire, social desirability to say you do not use any kind of drugs during pregnancy. And this is probably plays into um, a lot of the reasons why we see these di discrepancies in self-reported use and biologically ascertained use. The other thing is that a lot of the data we have about cannabis and ca cannabis and pregnancy and cannabis in general comes from a different time period. There was a huge boon of cannabis research in the 80s and 90s. These are the other things that were happening in the 80s and 90s, right? There's MTV and leg warmers and Atari and Pac-Man on Atari and things that like just aren't part of our lives anymore. Same thing, the cannabis that um, was present at that time is a different kind of cannabis than we see today. Um, today's products are much more potent. They're consumed in different ways. And so really, you know, we need more data about contemporary products. 
So what do we know about perinatal outcomes? There are a ton of data out there. I'm going to focus on a couple of meta-analyses that have really tried to synthesize the data for us. Um, just in the interest of time in this whirlwind uh, talk, we're trying to cover a really broad topic. So the first of these meta-analyses is one that was conducted by Gunn and colleagues, uh, a, a systematic review in meta. Their primary outcomes were pretty broad. They said they would include anything that had was maternal, fetal, or neonatal outcomes up to six weeks postpartum after cannabis exposure. And they conducted a meta-analysis when there are three or more studies available with the same outcome. So um, what they ended up looking at was anemia, low birth weight, birth weight, neonatal length, NICU admission, gestational agent delivery, head circumference, and preterm birth. And what they found is that the patients who used cannabis had increased odds of maternal anemia, low birth weight, and NICU admissions. But they said, geez, you know, we looked at all the data in 2016 and more studies are needed. We thought there was going to be more high quality data to look at here and there just wasn't. Another meta-analysis that also came out in 2016 by Connor and colleagues um, had a little bit more specific goal. They aimed to estimate if marijuana use increased the risk of adverse neonatal outcomes. And their primary outcomes were low birth weight, less than 2,500 grams, and preterm birth, less than 37 weeks. And their secondary outcomes are listed there. They found 31 studies total that they felt were high enough quality to be included in the meta-analysis, um, 12 that included low birth weight, and 14 that included preterm birth. And pooled unadjusted data demonstrated an association between THC or uh, cannabis and low birth weight or preterm birth. And you can see the rates there. But after they adjusted for tobacco and other confounders, they said there was no longer an association that the pooled relative risk for low birth weight was 1.1 and the confidence interval crossed one and the pooled relative risk for preterm birth was 1.0 and it crossed one. And they said, wow, you know, it seems like, you know, after this adjustment tobacco, we're not really seeing these effects of cannabis anymore. And maybe we shouldn't be focusing so much on cannabis, but they also did a plan sub-analysis where they looked at moderate to heavy use, which they defined as at least once per week. So I don't, you know, whether people would define that as heavy use, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a lower threshold than I would anticipate. So use at least once per week. And they found that cannabis was associated with low birth weight and, can, and uh, preterm birth when they looked at patients who had this heavier use pattern. And so this is the, these, these are really the data that ACOG relies on in their current practice guideline to say that uh, patients should not use cannabis while they're pregnant. We did a review article, uh, Laura Bergelt and I, uh, when I was in uh, Colorado and it was published in 2018, really trying to look at these data in summary. And I think this would be a good reference if people are interested in sort of what the data looked like up until then, put into a format that's readable for clinicians. And we combine these two meta-analyses, so the gun meta-analysis and the Connor meta-analysis in one figure, and sort of looked at what the forest plot would look like for all these different outcomes in pregnancy. And if you're familiar with forest plots, you know, one is sort of the line of unity, meaning that if, if these things cross one, um, then it's not significant. There's not a significant relationship. If things are to the right of one, then that relationship is concerning, right? There's an increased risk of these bad outcomes with cannabis use. And what you can get a general sense of in this figure is that all these are on the right side of one, right? Nothing saying that it's protective. A lot of them do cross one, but have really wide confidence intervals because there just weren't that many patients to look at with those various outcomes. So the estimate is not very certain. What you also see here is that there were some things that were significant. And this thing here, difference in birth weight, um, we it does not cross zero here. Okay, so we're looking at differences when we don't want it to cross zero because that would mean that it wasn't significant. We don't see these things crossing zero. And what we see is that, yeah, patients who are exposed to cannabis had babies that weighed less. And that really pans out in the literature. And I'm going to review that a little bit more. Um, this is more just to draw your attention. I know this isn't a great slide, but to a more recent uh, publication in JAMA Open in 2022. Again, sort of re-looking at these data, re-analyzing these data and meta-analyses. And you're just seeing the same thing here, really. You're seeing higher risk among patients that use marijuana or cannabis in pregnancy um, for low birth weight here. Again, these the, and the actual combined estimate here does not cross one, so concern for increased risk. Small for gestational age, same thing. Diamond is the combined estimate here, higher risk in patients who use cannabis. And they also looked at preterm delivery, same thing, higher risk in patients who use cannabis when they combined all these data.
And NICU admission was the last thing that they looked at. Again, that diamond shows you a higher risk. And so, you know, concern for increased risk of these adverse outcomes. What about stillbirth? You know, this is something that patients are very interested in, very concerned about. I will tell you that the data are really limited related to stillbirth. Um, there is one well done case control study by the Stillbirth Collaborative Research Network, and they did find an association between stillbirth and cannabis use, as demonstrated by a cord segment or cord homogenate that was positive for uh, cannabis metabolite or THC with an odds ratio of 2.3, so pretty significant. After they adjusted for cotinine or tobacco use, um, uh, and so cotinine and the maternal serum, which adjusts for tobacco use, they reduced the stillbirth odds ratio for cannabis by about 10%, but it was still significant. So we did still see a significant association between cannabis use and stillbirth uh, in this study. There are also not a lot of data about congenital anomalies. Um, these data are also uh, limited and mixed. Uh, there's an old study from 1983 that found no association with major malformation or birth defects is what we're talking about here. And there's been some other large retrospective cohort studies that are based on birth defects registries, but these are a little tricky. Um, often they have incomplete ascertainment of confounding factors, meaning that they didn't ask about other things that can influence the risk of birth defects, things like, you know, folic acid supplementation, things like maternal diabetes, other reasons that we know that patients have a higher risk of birth defects or malformations. And there's also potential for recall bias. Um, those, are, those of you who are physicians, you know, in medical school, we all learn about epidemiology and recall bias. And this is like the classic example of recall bias, right? You have a patient whose baby now has a congenital birth defect, a heart defect. You call her two years after that birth, which is frequently what happens with these birth defects registries. You ask her if she'd ever been exposed to cannabis during the pregnancy. And she has been like racking her brain for the past two years of all the things she possibly could have exposed herself to that could have possibly resulted in this birth defect. And she's like, yes, I was at a football game. I walked through the parking lot and some people were smoking cannabis and I know I inhaled some of it. Yes, I was exposed, right? And then you have somebody else whose baby's fine. You call her two weeks later, two weeks after her or two years after her delivery. And you say, oh, did you use cannabis during break? No, I mean, no, I didn't. And she, forgetting the fact that she did for the whole first month prior to really a uh, recognition of the pregnancy and during the period of embryogenesis. So I think that that's just very classic for um, recall bias. And so that's the limitation of these studies. There is one uh, very well done uh, birth defects registry study out of Atlanta, where they found 122 cases of ventricular septal defect in neonates, um, and uh, they also compared them to 3,000 controls. They did adjust for a lot of these confounders that we talked about, maternal age, race, overt diabetes, multivitamin use, and they found that periconceptual cannabis use was still associated with a heart defect called ventr ventricular septal defect, but they said more data are needed um, you know, this is one study, this needs to be replicated, and they concluded there wasn't adequate evidence of an association with any specific congenital birth defect. Very recently, there was a systematic review that was published in the Green Journal, um, where they pooled data from 11 studies. The pooled odds ratio for any congenital defect was 1.22. And they found two anomalies that they specifically said looked like they're associated with cannabis use, Epstein's anomaly, which is also a, a heart anomaly. Um, but there's only two studies that looked at this um, and then gastroschisis, and there are only five studies that looked at this. Um, and gastroschisis for people who are outside of the medical field is when the, um, the bowel is sort of on the outside of the abdomen instead of the inside of the abdomen um, at the time of birth. And they, but these investigators said, geez, these studies are really heterogeneous. We're really we're worried there's really high risk of bias in terms of how they collect the data. There's inconsistent evidence, so we just really don't know if cannabis use is, is associated with anomalies at this point. The other thing that really comes up a lot when we think about outcomes with cannabis use is neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk through that for the next few minutes here. Um, we know that there are alterations in neurotransmitters and rat models um, when can with cannabis exposure, especially in the dopaminergic pathways. There is a very well done study um, by uh, Yasmin Hurd and colleagues looking at uh, postmortem feed human fetal brains after elective terminations between 17 and 22 weeks. And they found that dopamine receptors were reduced in cannabis exposed fetuses. It was most prominent in males and it's directly correlated with the amount of cannabis used during the pregnancy. 
There have also been a couple, a, a few prospective longitudinal human studies where um, where they look at neurodevelopmental outcomes. There's three main ones. One is the Ottawa prenatal prospective study. Um, this was a low risk European American middle class uh, population. They had exposure to cannabis and cigarettes. Um, there's the MHPCD study, which was out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, much more high risk population, mixed ethnicity, mostly uh, African American and single, low so lower socioeconomic status, and they both they had exposure to cannabis and alcohol. And then the Generation R study, which is more recent out of the Netherlands in 2002, they started the study, larger, almost 10,000 people, multi-ethnic, higher socioeconomic status. So these are the kind of the main studies that are out there. And so what do they find? Well, first of all, we know that these data are limited by confounding, okay? So meaning that it is very, very hard, no matter how well the studies are designed, which all these were had an excellent design, uh, to account for all the other differences between the offspring who were exposed in utero versus those who weren't exposed in utero, right? There's ongoing exposure through breast milk, potentially. There's ongoing exposure, potentially, through the home. There's differential home environments. There's just things that make it very hard to make these comparisons. Um, but in the Ottawa study, or OPPS, they found no differences in the groups between below, below age four. But then at, starting at age four, they saw increased behavioral problems, worse language comprehension, decreased sustained attention and memory. And in the Pittsburgh study, they saw decreased verbal reasoning starting at age six, worse academic performance at age 10, and increased substance use at age 14, even after adjusting for ongoing parental substance use. It is biologically plausible that, that there is an effect on neurodevelopment. We know that cannabis crosses the placenta. We know that the endogenous or endocannabinoid receptors that are there um, are very important in neurodevelopment. And so this is where um, the, the foundation for these concerns. In the Generation R study, they, they saw higher aggression scores in cannabis-exposed girls, but not boys at 18 months. They did not see differences in behavior at three years of age, and they're doing ongoing follow-up into adulthood for children born between 2002 and 2006. There are a couple of recent studies that have been published on this as well. This is a big cross-sectional study of about 12,000 children. This is the ABCD cohort, which many of you may be familiar with, um, also known as the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. Um, they found a 6% uh, exposure rate to cannabis prenatally, which I think is probably about where it is um, nationally in that sort of 4 to 7% range. Um, they, saw mean, they saw these kids at a mean age at follow-up of 9.9 .9 years. They found that cannabis exposure after maternal knowledge of pregnancy was associated with greater psychotic-like experience and externalizing attention, thought, and social problems. There is a nice uh, review of the available literature also through the Nat National Academy of Sciences. Um, if you just Google Committee on Health Effects of Marijuana, it will come up. And there's a whole chapter on pregnancy and lactation if you have interest in this area. But what they concluded, I'll give you the punchline, is that there's a consistent association between prenatal cannabis use and lower birth weight in the offspring that there's limited evidence of an association between cannabis use and NICU admission. And they found insufficient evidence of an association between cannabis use and neurocognitive outcomes because they said exactly what I just discussed, that you cannot adjust for these subtle environmental differences. And so it just makes it hard to sort of say, yes, it was the cannabis exposure in utero and not all the other things that has happened to this kiddo between the time they were born and now assessing outcomes at four, six, 10 years of age of life. So what does ACOG say? ACOG says that people should not be using uh, marijuana during pregnancy or while lactating, and that OBGYN should not prescribe for medicinal purposes to pregnant or lactating individuals, and that there's insufficient evidence for effects on the nursing infant. And we're going to get a little bit into breastfeeding as well. So we've kind of reviewed what are the risks, what's known, what's unknown, the issues with the existing data. And so the question is, how are we doing now and talking to patients about cannabis use in our practices? So these are data from a study um, published by Holland and colleagues. They recorded patient encounters and evaluated obstetric provider response to disclosure of cannabis use. They found that 20% reported use at the OB intake. So this was a patient population with a high rate of use. We definitely see rates even as high as 30%, depending on the population that we're looking at. 
And they recorded encounters with 47 different healthcare providers. So it's not like this is one person's opinion or something that, but this is actual encounters with healthcare providers. And what they found is that 48% of the time, the provider did not even respond to a cannabis disclosure. So the patient said, you know, well, do you use any drugs? Will I use cannabis? Do you, what kind of work do you do? So there's just no, no response at all to the disclosure. And when it was discussed, the response was really nonspecific and focused on toxicology screens, social services, and punitive measures. It didn't invite a conversation about reasons for use and help the patient work through um, the potential risks. They said things like, you know how it alters your mind when you have it, how it makes you feel. So think about what's doing to your baby that isn't even formed quite yet. It gets the effects as well. And we don't want to do that to the baby. Well, I don't know. Do we, I mean, there's, there was, there, there's really no conversation here. And I don't feel like patients would feel informed by this. The problem is that if we're not giving good counseling to patients about cannabis use in pregnancy, there are other people who are willing to counsel them about cannabis use of pregnancy, and that may be misinformation. And so we actually did a study in 2018 when I was still in Colorado, where we called dispensaries. And this was a mystery shopper study. We called 400 randomly selected dispensaries that were licensed in Colorado. The caller said she was eight weeks pregnant with nausea. And nearly 70% of the dispensary employees that we talked to had product recommendations for the caller. So they predominantly recommended edibles. 65% of them based their recommendation on a personal opinion. So they think, said things like, well, personally, or in my experience, those kind of lead-ins. And only 32% of them recommended discussion with a healthcare provider without prompting. So they were not referring patients who were pregnant or saying they were pregnant to talk with anybody about cannabis use and pregnancy. They're simply recommending products that could potentially help with their nausea. So we need to talk to patients. We need to be educators about cannabis use and pregnancy, and we need to be forthcoming about the limitations of the data, what we know and what we don't know, um, and try to translate that into uh, information they can understand. Uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health did a real big push um, when uh, cannabis became legalized in Colorado, just about education about cannabis use in pregnancy. They made some clinical handouts, um, which and that looked like this. And so really, if nothing else, you know, if you have the capacity within your system to at least provide patients with a handout, you know, they say, well, yes, I'm using cannabis use during pregnancy. You know, we like, okay, you know, thank you for disclosing that to me. Um, you know, we do worry about some risks of cannabis use during pregnancy. And these are the things that we know. Um, even better, if you can have, take the time to say, well, why are you using cannabis? Um, Cause a lot of times, like we talked about, patients have a perceived benefit for anxiety, depression, pain, um, nausea, vomiting, for which we have safe alternatives for them in pregnancy. Okay, we're doing okay on time. So I am gonna go through uh, lactation as well. So when, um, so there are very limited data on breastfeeding um, and cannabis use. We do know that THC metabolite passes to the neonate in breast milk. Okay, that is known. It is. It happens in some small amount though. Initially, um, a lot of people used to cite a letter to the editor that was in the New England Journal of Medicine that included two patients. So I think that that's really important. I hear a lot of people still perpetuating this message. Well, chronic heavy use can result in levels up to eight times the plasma in the breast milk. That is based on one patient who had uh, plasma collected and breast milk collected. So I, I just wanna caution us against, you know, messaging too broadly about data from one patient in 1982. So what can we message about? There's a little bit more data, not a lot more. This was an observational study of eight women who purchased products with, unknown, with a known concentration of THC. So they said, yes, I wanna purchase based on this study. The investigator said, go to this dispensary and get this specific product. We know how much THC is in it. I want you to not use anything, not use any cannabis for 24 hours beforehand. I want you to then inhale the cannabis and then collect your breast milk at 20 minutes, one, two, and four hours. What could go wrong, right? We want you to go to dispensary, get some cannabis, get high, and then really specifically collect at these data points. There's limitations, but this is still better than one patient. And what they found was that exclusively breastfed infant ingests a mean of 2.5% of the maternal dose. So there's transfer. It's a small amount of transfer of metabolite. 
This is another study where they took 54 samples from milk donors and they found that Delta 9 THC or the cannabis metabolite is detectable in 63% of samples up to six days after the last reported use. So this is the other piece, right? People want to know, well, how long do I have to wait um, from cannabis use till I can use again, right? The classic, right? Alcohol use, pull up, just pump and dump. Unfortunately, cannabis and the cannabis metabolites are just not cleared very quickly from the breast milk. In this study, it was up to six days after the last report of use. I'm going to show some data that shows that it's much more, is, is probably even more prolonged after that. The median concentration that they found was 9.5 nanograms per ml. And not surprisingly, the number of daily uses and the time from sample collection to analysis were predictors of THC uh, concentration in the breast milk. Uh, we did a prospective cohort study in Colorado to try to estimate time to elimination of cannabis metabolite from the breast milk. The reason we did this is because patients want to know exactly what I said. Can I pump and dump? We enrolled 25 people. Um, one of the inclusion criterion was plan for abstinence. So patients were signing up for the study. We said, we only want you to sign up if we know, if you know, you're not going to use cannabis anymore. They all said, I'm definitely not going to. Interestingly, only 12 of the 25 were able to remain abstinent throughout the study period. And the primary um, inhalation, it was primarily inhalation consumption during pregnancy more than two times per week. These are the patients who enrolled. And they all had detectable THC metabolite in the breast milk in all participants during the whole six week study period, even though only about 50% of them continued to have use. So we collected 402 serial samples and we analyzed them. Um, the half-life of the metabolite was 17 days with a projected time to total elimination of more than six weeks. So really this tells us, unfortunately, there's not a situation where patients can pump and dump. So what do we tell patients? We need to tell them there's no known benefits of cannabis use in pregnancy, right? There's no study that says that, oh yes, it helps with X, Y, Z in pregnancy. There are possible risks of cannabis use in pregnancy. And we need to advise patients not to use cannabis during pregnancy and that there's no safe amount of cannabis in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. I do have a lot of grant support. Um, uh, there was some initial support through the University of Colorado CCTSI Child Maternal Health Junior Pilot Program. I also had support through the Women's Reproductive Health Research Scholar Program at the University of Colorado. And now more recently, I'm studying uh, pregnancy outcomes with cannabis use through a uh, NIDA R01. Thank you all so much. Um, that came in at like 38 minutes. I was supposed to talk for 30 to 45 so I could leave time for questions. So hopefully you all um, will have some questions for me. I'm going to stop sharing. And But there is my email address if anybody has additional questions after this. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Metz, for that fabulous presentation. So we are going to open it up for questions now. And we do ask that all questions be submitted through the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. And as a reminder, this webinar recording and the presentation slides will be available on our website, which is washtenaw.org slash marijuana in the coming weeks. So we do have a few questions um, that have come through the Q&A so far. For patients with subclinical levels of THC metabolites and or who deny use, is secondhand exposure to marijuana smoke a possible reason for that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We have very clearly delineated thresholds for tobacco or nicotine exposure for sort of passive versus active use. Um, that's well known in terms of biologic sampling. We're able to establish those cutoffs like in the clinical setting. Unfortunately, we don't have the same established cutoffs for passive versus active use for cannabis. Um, you know, one could imagine that, you know, if you have uh, exposure through secondhand exposure, you're going to get some exposure. But when we sort of try to correlate with the biological sampling, we don't have that same nice cutoff that we can, that like we do for codeine or nicotine. Same thing, codeine is the metabolite we look at for nicotine. Thank you. And then the next question is, do you have updated FAQs? Updated FAQs for the, like through the CDPHE data or? I, 
I assume for, for that or for, for anything patients. that can be yeah. shared out to patients. ACOG has a new handout actually that I tried to download the PDF for, and then, um, put in the slides. Unfortunately, it wouldn't let me, there's something that was blocking it on the ACOG website. Um, but for those of you who are obstetrician gynecologists or have access to ACOG, ACOG does have a new updated FAQ document that I think would be as nice for, um, for use with patients. Um, and I think, you know, and, and they do design those specifically to be patient handouts. Um, so, you know, if you're in a busy practice, like I get it, you only have 20 minutes for return OB. It's hard to review all this stuff with patients, but I think we can definitely do better than not responding to the disclosure at all. Even if we sort of have to, you know, go to a handout or, um, from ACOG, which is the most updated one that you guys can, that is, it is on the ACOG website. I just couldn't get it to download in a version. I could upload to a talk. Um, that is one option or honestly, like the big thing I found in talking to patients is saying, you know, we're, why are you using cannabis? Um, it's nearly always depression, anxiety, or nausea, uh, and pregnancy. And, we do have safe alternatives for those. And sometimes just talking through them and, you know, saying like, we definitely, you know, we have good evidence that cannabis decreases fetal growth and that's concerning to us. We know that it's crossing the placenta. So we know your baby's being exposed. We are worried about its effects on neurodevelopment. And we're worried about an increased risk of stillbirth and NICU admission. You know, a lot of moms will say, okay, well, gosh, I didn't know that, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I am interested in safe alternatives. You know, some patients have cannabis use disorder and that's not possible for them. They have a much harder time with cessation, but some patients are able to stop just with uh, education. Thank you for um, putting that up, Tess. Um, and this next question goes along also with what you were just saying. So just to, I just wanted to ask it just in case there was anything else that comes to mind. Um, so this question is, you stated it alters the mother's mind and therefore the child's. How does it alter the child's mind and how to explain it to a parent? Yeah, so that was actually a quote from a provider in that study. Um, and really I was trying to raise that as an example of like not useful counseling. Um, you know, that because probably because the, the patient would ask exactly the same question that you just asked. How does it how does it alter? What do you mean by that? And, and, and that was really the point I was trying to raise there when we, when they pulled those quotes from the counseling of patients in those encounters, they really found that the information that the patients were being given was not helpful. Okay. So I would not state it that way. I don't find that to be a helpful way. And so really what, what, you know, I tell patients related to neurodevelopment is that, you know, in the brain, there's a lot of receptors for cannabis like like a molecule so in your body there's receptors for cannabis that's why people have effects of cannabis they are also there for other reasons besides using cannabis right they are an important part of neurodevelopment and 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 development of the brain of in the of the fetus during pregnancy and so then interfering with that process by then bringing in cannabis that's not supposed to be there, the concern is that then that leads to developmental abnormalities. So the brain not developing the way that should because those that cannabis metabolite is crossing the placenta, interacting with those receptors in a way that wasn't intended. And so, you know, we can talk to patients about that. I also can, it, it sort of depends on their background, their education level, um, the, the level of information that they desire. Um, for patients that are more familiar with, you know, scientific literature, want to know more about the literature, then I think you can delve a little bit more into the other studies, you know, that there are, you know, three cohorts of, um, three cohorts, cohorts of patients that have been followed looking at neurodevelopmental outcomes, and that we do see changes really in school age among um, children who are exposed to cannabis in utero in terms of their ability to pay attention, their ability to be successful in school. Um, you know, I think I'm honest with patients and I say, look, a lot of things happen to kiddos between the time they're born and the time they go to school. So that's why there's not total certainty in those, but there, there really is plausibility for it. Um, more people are doing animal modeling now, and I think we're going to get more data through that. So non-human primates, um, it's now been demonstrated non-human primates also that with cannabis exposure, right. Without any other confounders, right. These are everything else in the environment is controlled. They are eating cannabis. Um, 
they're finding, you know, adverse effects on the placenta and poor fetal growth. And that's what we see in humans too. Um, but that's been, you know, disputed because of concerns that, well, there's a lot of other things that are going on there. How do we really know it's cannabis? I think that the animal models are going to help with that piece. You know, you really take out that human, other things are happening in the environment component and you do still see these effects on the placenta. You do still see these effects on fetal growth. And I'm hoping that this group um, that's doing the animal modeling will also start to look at um, the brains and the, the neurodevelopment of, of the non-human primates, because um, that'll be helpful because it's otherwise just really messy um, out in the world in terms of all the exposures that are there. Uh, and so I just think, you know, I try to be very honest with patients. We don't know all the answers, but we do have concerns. And I think most patients do want to optimize their pregnancy outcome and their outcome for their their kids. And if, you know, and, and sometimes when we just have a short conversation with them, they're willing to, to stop use. Great. Thank you. Um, and then the next question that we have, um, is about, is related to the IASIC website and wondering if you've checked that website for studies. Um, is that the international Alliance for Stillbirth. It is the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. Okay, obviously, I do not know that since I didn't know that acronym. So I have not, uh, I have not looked at that website myself. No, um, I just follow the literature and um, see what comes out when it comes out. But uh, thanks for the, I appreciate the the reference, and I will check it out. And then the next question is, when discussing with patients the risks and benefits of treating symptoms with, with traditional medications, mm -hmm. such as Zofran, SSRIs, et cetera, mm -hmm. in comparison to self-medicating with cannabis, is there a specific way you would like to frame the discussion or certain points you make in those discussions? Yeah. Um, so for example, with nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, right, if patients say that they're using it for that. Um, I just tell them that we have a number of other medications that have been very well studied in pregnancy, um, that have been demonstrated to not have risk. Um, and so I think that that's the, I think that's the difference. You know, we just don't know completely, especially related to birth defects, which is usually when people are using the, um, not the drugs for nausea and vomiting early in pregnancy, right. During embryogenesis. We, the, the data about birth defects is just really re remains unknown. Um, for cannabis, I showed you guys that meta-analysis and some registries, but I would say that largely we just don't have a great answer for that at this point. Um, and we know things, especially first line. So vitamin B6 unisom or diclegis is very well studied in pregnancy. We do not see an association with birth defects. I encourage people to use that as first line. A lot of times people actually haven't tried anything else, to be honest. Um, some of the older data, and I assume you're alert, alluding to related to Zofran, you know, there was some concern at, at, about a VS, VSD concern at some point that's really been disproven with subsequent epidemiologic studies. And so we really don't see that. Um, and so we, we, I do, you know, talk to patients about like, let's try some of these medicines that we know work and that we know, um, are safe. And I think that's the other piece, you know, the two cross-sectional, um, studies that we have about nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy, I shared with you guys now cross-sectional, meaning we kind of assess those things at the same time. So chicken and egg is hard to sort out, but people with cannabis had much higher rates of nausea in those studies. And so, you know, it may not just be that it doesn't help, it may be that it makes it worse. And certainly with, you know, cyclic vomiting syndrome and, um, that we see with cannabis use with chronic cannabis use, then we see horrible nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. But even outside of that, you know, people really seem to have higher rates of emesis, higher rates of nausea and what, what came first is, is hard. Um, but I try to encourage them to use other things in terms of depression, same thing. SSRIs are well studied in pregnancy. Um, you know, we talk to them about very low absolute risks of, um, you know, person with pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, um, some self-described, but limited neonatal withdrawal from SSRI. But also I think there's so much now focus on appropriately maternal mental health, uh, the need to adequately treat people for depression and anxiety and pregnancy. Um, you know, we, we really do use um, medications for mental health 
much very commonly in pregnancy. Now, um, a lot of my patients are on medications for mental health disorders, and we encourage them to continue them um, because we know that untreated depression, and anxiety are associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes, preterm birth, low birth weight. Um, so again, encouraging patients to use data, use medications that we have data on, use medications that have more uncertain, that have more certainty that are regulated, that we know what dose they're getting every time. Um, and that don't have some of these other concern for risk. Thank you. And then the next question is, do you know of any differential effects on maternal child health for co-occurring use of nicotine and cannabis? Yeah, there's one paper out there um, that looks at co-occurring use and, and they posit that it's worse to have co-occurring use. I will tell you that it, in the majority of papers, that is very hard to suss out um, the difference between, you know, how often people are using, you know, tobacco without cannabis or cannabis without tobacco products. Older products were often combined products. Now people are using um, less combined products and more that have, you know, just cannabis and not tobacco. And so I think it is an area that we need further investigation of. I think part of the problem though, too, is that people are much more willing to report tobacco use. And so when you're doing self-reported studies that look at, you know, tobacco and cannabis use, you're probably capturing a lot more of the tobacco use and a lot less of the cannabis use by just asking them out of it. So the result is hard to really know what to make of it, right? In terms of it's the tobacco or the cannabis, because you may be misclassifying people as not using cannabis who are, if that makes sense. Um, and so underestimating sort of the effect of cannabis. Um, and so, I mean, it's an important area of research. You know, I think we have a pretty strong campaign and from a public health standpoint already to tell patients to not use tobacco during pregnancy. I think that message has been heard loud and clear. Most patients are aware of that. You know, when I bring that up with patients in practice, they know that. Um, I would say that's less so with cannabis. Um, patients have not heard the message that you know, they shouldn't use cannabis during pregnancy or that we have concern for risks of cannabis during pregnancy. Thank you. The next question is, would there be a time when the benefits of breastfeeding for both mom and baby outweigh the risk of breastfeeding if mom uses cannabis? Yeah. I mean, I think most of the time, to be honest with you, and I, you know, and I don't, you know, this is a point of much controversy. I recognize that I am often asked about this. Um, you know, we know of a ton of benefits of breastfeeding, right. Um, both for moms and babies. Um, we know not a lot about cannabis, you know, in contrast to the pregnancy data where I showed you guys just like a summarized little snippet of a large world of data. I pretty much showed you all the breastfeeding data that exists. Um, and so it's not much. Um, and so what we do know is that metabolite crosses to the breast and the breast milk. We do know that it is much smaller amount than what maternal ingestion is. And we don't know if the neonatal gut even absor absorbs that metabolite. So we haven't, you know, there aren't people who have then taken that to the next level of then sampling the neonates blood um, to see if we have circulating metabolite and neonatal blood that could then influence other function. So it's, it's, you know, there's still unknowns. We know that it's a small amount. We know that happens now. We, you know, we really say, you know, at least our, at our institution, you know, we tell moms, you know, that it does cross, we encourage them not to use cannabis while breastfeeding, but it's not a situation where we would withdraw lactation support from them or tell them that they just should never breastfeed. It's, it's really because there's so many other benefits to breastfeeding. Um, we just want to provide the education. Right. Um, and the reality is that most patients who are using cannabis during breastfeeding also used it during pregnancy. Typically the exposure is probably much higher in the pregnancy than during the lactation period, just because, you know, in pregnancy, right. It's just blood transfer across the placenta during lactation, you're getting transfer into the breast milk and then breast milk transfer to the neonate, which then goes to the neonatal gut. There's a lot more barriers that happen in that time. So really, you know, I don't think we're like saving anybody from a large amount of exposure that hasn't already, you know, that they haven't already kind of had during that in your, in your neurodevelopment phase. 
that being said, like we should tell parents it crosses. We should tell them not to use cannabis. Unfortunately, that's not a pump and dump scenario. I did show you hopefully convincing data for that. The half-life is very, very long in the breast milk. Um, and so really it's, it, it's a desire for total abstinence during that time. But I certainly would not say to patients, like you shouldn't breastfeed if you're going to use cannabis ever. I mean, it, it, there's just so many other, there's so many benefits to breastfeeding and we just don't have that much data about cannabis use. That may change, you know, as we garner more data, maybe we'll fall more on the side of saying, eh, like it's really like the risks outweigh the benefits, but I don't think with the availability of data right now that we can say that all we can do is counsel patients against it. I know that's right. highly controversial. <laughs> Great, thank you. And we do have two more to address before um, in our next few minutes before the webinar closes. This next one is for those who may be interested in undertaking further research around cannabis use and pregnancy breastfeeding, where do you think would be the most beneficial next areas to further investigate? Yeah. I mean, I think more modern cannabis pro products are valuable to investigate. I think really clear delineation of use is critical. So, you know, being able to look at use patterns across the pregnancy, was it used just during the first trimester? Was there use extending across the pregnancy? Does it matter how much and when that's actually what my R01 is studying. And we're close to having some results on that, which I think will be really helpful. Um, and then, you know, I think also, you know, talking to patients about, you know, what, why do you use cannabis? How can we better and more effectively message about cannabis use? Um, so that there's not the same percentage, uh, the same perception of safety. And then the breastfeeding world is pretty wide open. There's still a lot to be done there. Um, those are, you know, those, those three studies are it, you know, in some that's less than hundred patients. So we really do need a lot more data in that arena. It's challenging to study this, right? Um, there's reporting laws in states, most of the work that I have done has been because I've been able to de-identify samples completely so that there's not a reporting requirement. Um, we're doing it remotely from the time. So that's, it's, you know, it's not easy, which is why we've had some limitations to these, these uh, situations. You know, we were able to enroll patients to disclose use. We know it's disclosed, it's reported, then we can study them. There's ways to do it, but there are definitely some IRB hurdles. Thank you. And then this next um, piece in the Q&A is a comment um, regarding that IASIC question from earlier. Um, just a comment that IASIC has updated studies. Oh, great. Great. Um, and with that, we just have a couple minutes left. I want to thank you, Dr. Metz, and I want to thank all of our attendees um, for the energy and the discussion and the comments and the questions.